Hey, everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the farmer's market podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer, food maker, or artisan crafter selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. I'm Kat Fields-White. And I'm Bridget Myers. We're longtime farmer's market managers, educators, and consultants. Today, we're going to chat about how to nurture prospective vendors. Did you resolve to follow your dreams and open a market business in 2024? Have you been operating for a little while and need a checkup to be sure you're not missing opportunities to succeed? Today's episode of Temp Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast, is supported by Vendor 101, an online class designed to help you discover whether your farmer's market business idea is feasible, how to take the next steps to join your local markets, and how to operate profitably once you're there. Market managers, an educated vendor is a successful and happy vendor. We refer new applicants to the online class at our own markets, and it saves us loads of time answering basic questions about permits, labeling, and more over and over and over. Register for Vendor 101 online now at FarmersMarketPros.com and let your prospective vendors know to do the same. Well, welcome back to Tent Talk, everybody. We have had a few folks in our online community asking about vendor education lately. They want to know what's available and whether they should start a vendor education program for their existing vendors and for new applicants. There is not a shred of doubt in my mind that one of the smartest things we ever did in our years as market managers was start the Vendor 101 program. It saved us so much time in the application process, and it really has produced more successful vendors. Yep, we have some great success stories, which is always really exciting, from longtime vendors that have built businesses that support their families to ones that have started online or retail shops along with their market businesses. It's been amazing how some of those folks have grown. We have a vendor that started. They're not a vendor anymore. (laughs) That's the only tricky thing, right? If you teach them how to do this really well and they expand, do they leave you? But some of them don't. Some of them do both. But we do have a vendor that started with Vendor 101, Went on Shark Tank, made a deal with Mark Cuban, Mm -hmm. and now has a a product that is sold all over the U.S., I think into Canada, and I'm not sure that I didn't see it overseas. I believe that, I feel like I've seen it in Hawaii. Yeah. Like, yeah. They're everywhere. Called Mush. Mush. It's great. It's on the Cold Oats. Yeah. It's on the shelves everywhere. Everywhere. It is so amazing. I saw a big Target billboard when I was in Philadelphia last year for Mush. I I know. I've seen that. They grew up so fast. Oh, my gosh. And they were lovely. Those ladies have really kind of kicked ass along the way. So that's always really exciting to see. And we also have so many Vendor 101 graduates that are in our market still to this day that are just doing so amazing and just so proud. Just so proud. Proud mama. Yeah, we are. I mean, not to say that. Vendor 101 was the sole <laughs> reason for Mush's enormous With, success. Without but us. Without us, they would have never been in Target. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we like to think we helped. Yeah, I mean, it's just <laughs> nice to, like, be a little piece of the puzzle. That's right. So it's fun. So should folks out there, other managers, use the resources already available or reinvent the wheel and make it a custom wheel exactly to the specifications that they want their own vendors to know? That's what we're going to talk about here. Mm-hmm. So there's a few things. You can use what's out there. Yeah, I think there there are a lot of resources out there like we're going to talk about, but it's, you know, sometimes it's not exactly what you think your prospective vendors need or want. And so then you might be thinking of how you can do it differently or better, which is kind of how Vendor 101 was born. I mean, there wasn't really anything around back then, but it was really helpful. Our classes have definitely been used by a lot of vendors, and it's geared mostly to food vendors and small farmers. Yeah, our Vendor 101 program is definitely pointed that way, although we've had a lot of crafters that have taken it and uh, and said they appreciated it. And we've had chefs that have taken it that actually own restaurants but want to do this little spinoff business that they're going to put into markets. And even though they know how to run a restaurant, that doesn't necessarily mean you know how to price a retail product or operate in farmer's markets. So we have found all kinds of people have um, used this successfully. But because there's a lot of permits required and kind of food safety handling kind of things, um, there seems like there's more to know for people that are in food and farms than there would be for non-food. So there are certainly a lot of extra sections in the class that only apply to those folks, not so much for the non-food folks. But we started Vendor 101 as a classroom class. We would put everybody together in a room, uh, teach it for, oh, my gosh, it went four and a half, five hours yeah, plus a lunch break in the middle because who can sit there for that long? So mm-hmm. it, it was a long class. Um, we loved the classroom environment. Yeah. 
I honestly think to some extent, some people certainly get more out of the classroom environment than they do by doing it self-paced online, although we do include an, an online question and answer session when you sign up for the class, when you finish it. You come on Zoom with us. We answer your questions one-on-one about your business. Um, But we did switch to online during COVID, and that has been great, largely because it meant that vendors from all over the country have started taking it, and actually a lot of Canadians. We've got a lot of Canadian vendors that have taken our online class and gone on to be really successful in their markets, which they couldn't do if they had to sit in the classroom here in San Diego. So moving it online has really made it way more accessible. Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of pros to moving it online. Also, we used to teach it like on Mondays because we didn't have a market then and it was just a better day for us. Maybe some Sundays too because we didn't have a Sunday market for a little bit. But not everyone who was thinking about starting a vendor business was available on those days. And so whether they needed childcare or they had other things going on on those days or they had a Monday through Friday job that they were thinking about switching, but they can't take a class on a Monday because they have to go to work. So, you know, I think we missed out on some folks. But yeah, I definitely missed the classroom too because it was nice to talk to everybody one-on-one. And and sometimes we would have folks in there that were, that were just like, I just want to take this class because I've just always been curious. Yeah. Like they're market shoppers and they just want to know like, what is this job to be a market vendor? So it was really nice to just talk to all sorts of different people. Sometimes people would like bring us samples to the class just because. I remember Maya from Maya's Cookies came and took Vendor 101 and she brought cookies and I go, okay, this doesn't count as your like vendor application process because you need to fill out the application and then we schedule a time to bring samples. But I was like, but if you want to leave those cookies... <laughs> I will definitely eat them. <laughs> and they were so good. So good. So good. So Talk about a superstar vendor. Oh, man. That has actually also added online and retail stores and still comes to the market. So we love her. Still in the market. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, definitely it's nice to have an option. Um, if you're going to create an online course or something that's virtual, you know, you'll get folks that maybe aren't available for the classroom time. So there are definitely pros and cons to that. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's great that Vendor 101 itself is available online. So no matter where you are, you can use that. And then what mm-hmm. we've done, too, is created sometimes a white label or a customized version, like your private label Vendor 101. So Koppel Farmers Markets in Texas, for instance, they send their prospective vendors and some of their existing vendors to that class. They hired us to create an introductory section that talks about the Koppel Farmer's Market. Then those folks go through the regular sections that are in every version of um, Vendor 101. And then we have their closing section for that one. Talks very specifically about the permits required in that part of Texas and what the Koppel Farmer's Market and their affiliates look for in a vendor. So um, we're happy to do that for folks that are out there. So if you're thinking about starting a class and would like a little shortcut, Mm -hmm. we would be happy to do that for you. Mm -hmm. And then there's some other folks that are offering educational services for vendors that you might be able to refer people to or partner up with. Yeah. So there's a lot of state farmers market associations that have classes available. Um, Local small business development groups might offer classes and they are, those are typically in person. I think they want to sit down and kind of work stuff out. There might be worksheets that they can do and kind of talk to some people about basic accounting and business startup and things like that. So that's really great for them as well. Um, SCORE and other organizations. SCORE is the Service Service Corps Corps. of Retired Executives. I remember that about half the time, but I was able to come through because I could see you weren't remembering it today. (laughs) I was like, the end is retired executives. What's the beginning? (laughs) But so helpful. It's just folks that have had businesses, they have the experience, and they, you know, provide their services for people just getting started, which I think is so great. Yeah, it's very cool. And they try to match you up with a SCORE advisor that has been in a business similar to yours. So if you've got a retail food business, they... They try to match you up with somebody that's been in that kind of business. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've, we've had people that have had really good success with SCORE. Oh, yeah. There's just so much to get a business started. It's like they, people need all the help they can get. Um, and then some incubator kitchens offer more instruction, you know, at the kitchens or through, you know, classes that they provide. So that's always really great. Yeah, some of them are, you know, commercial kitchens. Sometimes they'll give you some tips on labeling and things like that, food handling. Um, Sometimes they have information on hand about what kind of permits you will need, for instance, to get into farmer's markets in your area. And then some of them are really well-developed incubator kitchens. So like Hope and Maine, back east, they do amazing stuff where they send people through this whole long class and they do evaluations of each step, how they're progressing, and then they get to the point where they can operate in markets. They have a market on site at that incubator kitchen facility, and then a lot of their graduates go out into other markets in that area. Yeah, that's awesome. So there's a lot of resources online that you can access, people that are already doing this job. I mean, definitely like look around first. And if there's someone that's doing a program that's already available and to create your own class would be burdensome on your schedule, just figure out how to 
point people in that direction or partner with people. Maybe if there's another group that's just getting started, you can partner, kind of start out that way. But yeah, they, I was able to actually, there's a community college near us that yeah. has, they do a whole like long semester long class on small farmers and how to make a small farmer's business successful. And I've often gone in and taught one class during that semester for folks to just briefly explain how to make it work at a farmer's market, some basic display techniques, how do you do pricing and and that kind of thing. So maybe you can kind of promote your market and get out there and help with educating people just by sliding into somebody else's program. For sure. And they would probably be really grateful for that. I know we used to have um, a program, Axion, that's here in San Diego, and they would come to our Vendor 101 class in person and talk about like the business startup part of it. And it was like, we could talk about that, but it was great to just take a break for 15 minutes while they were there and have them talk about that part. So you know, kind of partnering with somebody else and providing your expertise could help, you know, widen your network and bring people to your market as well um, if someone's already teaching the class. Yep. So definitely sure. reach out to that. Yep. And then the other option that you have is to create your own class. And I know that there was some chatter in our private group about that, that people that wanted to get their own program started and how to do that and where to start. I mean, creating a class is kind of like creating a farmer's market or starting a business. It always costs a little more and takes a little more work than you'd think. Mm -hmm. We love that sign. We're going to post it on our social pretty soon. (laughs) There's a big sign that says, we don't do it because it's easy. We do it because we thought it would be easy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Isn't that just our life? Right. So this pertains to so many things. <laughs> uh, but if you're going to go ahead, understanding that it's yeah. not easy, but that it's valuable and it's so fun, actually, to yeah. help educate a startup kind of business that's just getting going and you want to be part of that process, it's wonderful to see them develop. So there's some things that you want to think about when you are going to start an education program for vendors. Are you going to do it online or in a classroom? Yep. And like we said, there's pros and cons to both. So just think about, like, what does your time allow? What Do you have space? If you're going to be in person, where are you going to hold this class? Um, Partner with a kitchen or a local small business organization or a school. We've done our class in many different locations, actually. We kind of had space at an office that we were in for a little bit. Um, We, you know, held it at a public market. Held it at our public market, yes. That was really fun because we could walk people around, too. And then we have, like, a conference space now in our office now, but we didn't have that for a long time. So that's where we held it before we transitioned online. But yeah, you can use someone's conference room that they're not using. I mean, you're probably going to be like at an off day if you have it like a Sunday afternoon. I mean, there's probably office conference rooms that are not being used. So think about asking folks if they would let you use that space or rent it. You want somewhere kind of quiet where you have tabletop available. We had a slideshow, so we needed a projector and, you know, have some kind of light food and beverage there and stuff. So just think about anything that you would want for a day class and um, yeah, there's probably a lot of spaces that you could use. Yep. Got to think about how many students at once is ideal. We mm-hmm. tended to run, we usually, if we had a super full class, we'd have like 28 or 30 people. Mm-hmm. Again, part of that depended on where the space was that we were using it. Once we yeah. had our own classroom, which was in our kind of conference area that's in the complex that we're in now, we had 28 chairs and that's <laughs> that's typically yeah. how many people we would have in seats. But we also had classes when we were in different spaces and earlier on where we had 12 students, and that was great too. Yeah. You do want some kind of critical mass of people that are attending because the questions that various people ask always help those folks that are a little bit more shy about formulating a question and saying it out loud. So if you've got a good enough group, it kind of helps them to toss ideas and questions back and forth and helps you kind of get into the nitty-gritty of of what they really need to know. If you're going to do an online class... There's a few different ways to do that. You can, our very first online class, because it was a hustle situation Mm -hmm. where we had a class scheduled and COVID happened and you weren't allowed to put people in a room next to each other anymore. (laughs) Um, We did a Zoom class, Mm -hmm. which we recorded. And then we, that was our first online class that we sold. So we used that for two or three months after that while we thought about production quality and how we would put together a class online that was a little bit more entertaining than staring at those talking heads for <laughs> four hours. <laughs> so, but that's that's a lift. Yeah. You know, so if you've either got to have somebody that's a pretty good video producer and or graphic designer that knows how to manage digital things mm-hmm. um, to make it pretty. And somebody, of course, that can talk and voice over. Uh, your local podcast host can help you with that. <laughs> uh, so you can do an online class. It is, in some ways, a little bit more complicated technically. And I still do know of classes in different parts of the country um, that are terrific classes that are Zoom. 
that are all done on Zoom. So oh, yeah. that's still a possibility. Whether you do a live Zoom and mm-hmm. cover all of your information that way, or whether you record a Zoom that then you're putting out for people to, to tune in on their own schedule. Yeah. And again, just really pros and cons for both options. I think it's kind of nice to be live because then folks can ask questions as you're going. What I felt was kind of a difficult transition when we put our class online was we had to write our whole script out, which Kat and I always just taught the class. We never had anything written down. We had like an outline and then we just taught what we knew. And it's something like this podcast. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> you know, we're looking at the and then, you know, we'd wander and tell stories. And... But it's a little, but it's more fun. Like, I feel like, you know, we're just kind of going off script right now and like chatting and, you know, saying little anecdotes or maybe we'll, I would add something that happened to the market just the previous day. And so there'd be like a fun, interesting story. But when you have to, when you're going to record a class, we had to write everything out. And that was so like tedious and I didn't want to forget anything. And I had to think about like, what do I say in the class? We kind of looked at the Zoom that we had taught live and kind of transcribed that. And it was a little bit harder. But so it, it, to me, it felt a little more like stiff. And we really had to like zhuzh it up to make it easy to listen to for a few hours because these right. folks are going to sit down and take this class. You don't want to, you know, bore them to death. So um, if you're going to do a recorded class, kind of think about that. It takes time. You, I mean, you don't want to slap that together. I thought it was going to take a lot less time than it did. It ended up taking us a lot of time. A lot of time. Oh, my gosh. So many hours. <laughs> yeah, Between yeah. writing the script, between doing the voiceovers, um, Justine, our old partner that we worked with on on the graphics and the videos, which she made very entertaining and we made very visual because, again, otherwise the folks will tune out if they're listening mm-hmm. to just an audio for so long. Yeah, she had to go get video at our markets, at other markets, and all the graphics and transitions. She basically like taught herself how to be a video editor. So it might be easier if you hire somebody that knows that, that, but she was like, I'll figure it out. So, I mean, she ended up doing a really great job, but again, just took a lot of time to really get it produced to the quality that we really wanted it to be. And that was really helpful and that folks could really, I mean, folks that take the class now are like, wow, that class is amazing. It's really helpful. And it's because it's produced well. So absolutely. But you know, run it on Zoom, do what you need to do. A Zoom class is great. I mean, like my daughter's in college and she takes college classes on Zoom and she learns a ton. So, like, you can definitely learn a ton online if you want to teach that virtually. Yeah. You know, go for that. Yeah. For sure. Mm-hmm. So what would you cover in that kind of a class? Um, it partly depends on who you're doing it for. Mm-hmm. So our Vendor 101 class was originally designed to cut down on our workload in terms of taking applications and inquiries, honestly. Mm -hmm. So we realized that so many people would call us or send us an email that said, I want to get started in the farmer's market. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a five-minute answer. And it it turned out that we were devoting endless amount of hours of staff time, paid staff time, Mm -hmm. to taking those calls and going through those explanations over and over and over again, one-on-one with whoever (laughs) was calling or emailing. And so the whole goal of Vendor 101 was to put everybody in a room together and be able to answer 28 people's questions all at the same time because they all had basically the same questions. So we really use it a lot to this day for prospective vendors when somebody contacts us or they fill in an application and they've never been in a market before. Mm -hmm. We will not necessarily insist, but certainly strongly encourage that an inexperienced market vendor take the class before they come in. And honestly, we are very clear when the class starts that um, part of what you're offering there is a chance for a minimum amount of time and a little chunk of money, but way less than you would spend to start a business for the opportunity to figure out, is this even the life for you? You know, does your business have the potential to be profitable? This is a small feasibility study that we're going to do on your business. We give you worksheets to do where you can figure out what your costing is and then look at what other markets are available out in the world and at what price. And does your costing support selling it at that price and still making a profit? And we get you up to speed on what kind of labels are legally required for a packaged product and then how to finance your business and what you want to watch out for and how you need to pay yourself and watch out for tax-wise and how you raise those funds. So it it covers a lot from the very beginning to the application process and to what you'll need to operate at markets from equipment to procedures, best practices. So we use it a lot for potential vendors or brand new vendors. Now, when we did the customized version for Koppel, What they really wanted to do was be able to use it that way, but also offer it to their existing vendors that they felt needed a little boost on, are they selling the products at the right price to be successful? And are they labeled correctly? And, you know, what what would good display practices be? So we designed that one where the intro to that class, and we may go back someday and do that for for our own, the version that we use worldwide. But um, one of the things we do is say, hey, if you're already a vendor, 
you might not need section one and section three, which are on developing your business structure and how to raise funds to get your business started. But you might want to do section two, which is on costing and pricing your product and see if maybe your prices need to be revised so that you could have a more profitable business. So there's ways to use our class that are good for both brand new, prospective, just thinking about it vendors and vendors that are already in markets and need a little boost. Yeah, it's really far reaching. I feel like it's just kind of applies to everybody. And we had always said at the beginning of our classes that we taught in person, you know, one of two great outcomes is going to happen. Like you said, you're either going to get really, you know, excited and motivated and have the knowledge and like the baseline, you know, information that you need to get started and go launch a really successful business. Or at the end of this class, you're going to say, wow, uh, this is a lot more time and effort and commitment than I thought was necessary to pop a little tent and a little farmer's market. And I'm sure glad I spent five hours and a couple hundred bucks on this as opposed to hours and hours and hours and weeks and months and, you know, time and effort and money trying to get this started only to realize once I'm at a market that it's not something I want to do. Yeah. Because it's not for everybody. And that's okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Dodgeable. Yeah. Some of those folks. Mm -hmm. Um, But so you need to think about if you're going to create your own class, who are you trying to educate? Are you trying to educate your current vendors? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to educate brand new vendors that are entering the market? Do you want to go farther back and cover things that people need to know who are prospective vendors and are just exploring the idea of getting into markets? And that's how you'll decide on your curriculum. So you can go all the way back to the basics like business structure and financing, or you can make it just farmer's market operations specific. Yeah. And and definitely kind of hone that in a little bit because when you try to teach some material to too wide of an audience, the message gets lost. I know we've kind of had some ideas like, let's do a course on this. And we're like, who are we talking to? And it's, you know, you try to kind of sound it out. And it's like, you're you're saying too many different things. And you're like, well, if you do this, do this. And if you do this, do that. I mean, you want to narrow it down a little bit. And it might seem a little bit too like niche, but really know who you're talking to. Know who you want to come to this class. Got to know your audience. Yep. Is it going to be a one-time class or, as somebody in our group suggested, do you mm-hmm. want to create an ongoing mentorship program? Mm-hmm. And we've talked about doing that ourselves. We talked about taking Vendor 101 a little bit farther and making it you know, like a six-month program where we would meet with people once a month and we'd give them homework to do in between so that they could build their businesses. So think about how you want to operate. If you just want to do this one-time class once a month, you want to do it just once and sell it on video, you want to do an ongoing one-on-one mentorship with a person or a group of people that are just getting started in markets. Yeah, maybe just start, like, ease and do it. (laughs) Because, I mean, I would love to have a mentorship program. I would, like, the best part of, I feel like, our job is to see these businesses, people with great ideas come in and start their businesses, and we see their kind of journey with that and get to kind of help them, point them in the right direction and help them with display and pricing and all those things. I mean, that's just so fulfilling, but it, that takes so much time. So it does. And it's also, part of your market manager kind of duties. You yeah. do that casually as you go, but formalizing that so that people get more one-on-one attention and have sort of a really logical path to how they expand and grow could be really valuable. Super valuable. And if you have time in your schedule for that, I mean, and you have the knowledge to do it, please do it because it's so needed. But if you're really busy, maybe your staff is tight, you have multiple markets and you're kind of juggling a lot already, think about like an online course is great for that because you do all the work on the front end and then it's just out there for people to watch, um, you know, and you don't you can still do your market job. Yep. For sure. So once you have a class, then you want to think about how are you going to charge for it? Mm -hmm. I mean, some people talk about doing free classes. Yeah. And that's cool if you've got the time and you don't. Maybe you're on salary with somebody, Mm -hmm. you know, a business organization or a city or something, and you're able to kind of blend that in so that you're actually still covering your time. Don't have to charge for it. That's fine. Um, You can set a price for it that covers your time. You can then do scholarships or not do scholarships. I will say that we found that folks that pay to take the class Mm -hmm. sometimes take it more seriously. Yeah. And we don't want to encourage the idea that if you can't afford a $195 class, you have enough money to start a business. I mean, that's really what it came down to sometimes when we were looking at, at people that would suggest, oh, well, I can't really afford to take the class. They are the same folks that maybe don't realize how much money you have to invest in starting a business. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times we'd tell them, you know what, I think the class would be premature for you. I think what you should do first is maybe do a little bit more research on what it's going to start, what it's going to take to start up your business. Um, 
examine whether this is really the right time for you? Do you have the time and the financial resources available to start a business right now? Yeah, and it's okay to say, you know, there's a value to this class and your business and your business model is not to invest in other people's businesses. Um, Well, I am very grateful that there's a lot of companies that do that and there's really great grant programs to get business started and there's a lot of great program and other people that are working on that. If your business, like ours is, is to, you know, this is how we make our living. This is how we feed our families is our business. We don't offer grants and we don't offer, you know, a lot of scholarships for our classes and our educational material because there's a value to it and this is how we make our business. Um, I think it's okay to have those conversations. And we've had a couple of conversations like that and they're like, well, you know, I'm just getting started or, um, you know, I didn't I didn't have anybody backing me and I don't have a lot of money to get started. And and so having those conversations and saying, well, starting a business is going to be really, really difficult for you if you don't have a little bit of startup to put into some education on the front end. Maybe you can get someone that you work with that will pay for all that education for you. And that's a great partnership. And then definitely come back to us. So making sure you're not like leading someone on because sometimes it just feels like you're leading them on if you're going to give them this like free class but they don't really understand the finance part of it right yeah yeah and if you've got somebody to support you you know if you've got some organization near you that wants to pay those folks mm-hmm. entry fee and then work out whatever deal they are with with the individual business owner that maybe that's something they pay back over time yeah um, you know or maybe it's just a philanthropic measure in your area where they're trying to encourage small businesses to start, that's great. But just think about covering your time and and think about the idea that sometimes things that are free, people don't take them as seriously or make as big a commitment to them. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, and of course, you will get other rewards besides the, uh, you know, a charge for doing the class. Vendor success and retention are mm-hmm. their own rewards. So if you've already got people in your market and what you want to do is create a class for them to make their businesses stronger, at that point... I, I might look more at doing a class that was free or, you know, very nominal, you know, $10 because I got to devote my time. So we'll we'll do that um, because you're going to be rewarded on that end by having more successful vendors. You know that they're already committed to doing markets. You know that they've got skin in the game on their business and they are they just would like some tips. It's awesome to do a class for existing vendors that maybe you just offer, you know, twice a year for, for people that want to join in. Yeah, and I know we've talked to market managers that have kind of vendor meetings and and things like that. And I know that there's education components in that as well. So kind of turning that into a little bit more formal class for your existing vendors, that will that does have a good ROI for you because right. it comes back in the form of vendor retention. So yep. yeah, keeping that in mind. So if you do create a class, um, think about when and how to launch that. So we see with seasonal markets like Hopple and other markets that we've um, created group sessions for, that a lot of times if they're seasonal, they do it maybe a month or two before the season starts. So that's a really good time to offer a class for existing vendors and for people that are going through an application process that may only last for a certain amount of time each year. So that's a good time to do it. If you're doing it uh, for a market that's in existence all year and you're constantly taking applications, we have our class available all year round. We do find that January through March tend to be very busy periods. I think people make those resolutions that they're going to follow their dreams and start their business. So we see kind of a big uptick then. We tend to see a big uptick in the early fall. Again, I think people are sending their kids back to school and they're thinking about, are they going to do something different with their lives? And so you'll see a lot happening then. So um, advertising and promoting it, it's uh, you can reach out to commercial kitchens and let people know that you've got this available for people thinking about going into business. You can reach out to maybe local chefs organizations. A lot of times people that are in restaurants have an idea to make that sauce that they use into a product. Um, That's a good way to attract people. You can tell your existing vendors that the class exists so that they can share that with other people that they know because they're going to hear from a lot of people either that they know or just walking through the market and their customers that say, oh, this is cool. I'd like to have a business like yours. How do I do that? And we found that a lot of our vendors love to say, oh, you should take that class. <laughs> that that way they're not taking their time to try to explain it, but they aren't just saying, oh, well, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. Um, they're offering them a resource. That's such a pro tip. I feel like having our vendors kind of have our little stack of cards in their booth and just say, hey, you can hand this to people who are asking how to get a vendor business started. It's kind of then you can go on with your sales for the day and also give them a really good resource because they're not going to get a full picture just talking to a vendor for 10 minutes in a market. And then also keep a little stack of cards in your pocket so that when you're out and about in the world, I know conversation just kind of 
goes to farmers markets <laughs> wherever I may be. And so talking to people who are like, oh, I have an aunt who makes a really great salsa. She's always thought about selling it at farmers markets. I can give her that information right then and there. So just a little organic reach. For sure. Promoting it at your markets is really, oh, really effective. If sure. you have cards or we have a sign at our markets and at some other people's markets, for that matter, mm -hmm. that have a QR code on it so that when people approach the info booth and say, hey, can I set up my tent? <laughs> and, and you ask them a few <laughs> questions, determine that they're not really in a business. They don't have a, a permit or or maybe they have a tent, maybe not. <laughs> uh, it's good at that point to be able to point them towards a resource that, so that they can learn what it takes to be in a farmer's market. We find that super effective. They're usually really grateful for that, too. They just need some info. Sometimes, I mean, that information is doesn't all live in one spot. And it's probably really difficult to think about starting a vendor business because you don't know where to go for that stuff. So having those resources, you're really going to, it's going to be such a benefit to the vendors. Absolutely. And especially for brand new vendors or uh, prospective vendors, one of the big ways that that happens is both at our markets and at other markets who are aware of our program is that when somebody applies, if they don't have experience and they don't have permits um, or they're just sending you an email inquiry, you can say, hey, you know what? There's this whole class. I'm sorry, this is more than I can answer in, in a simple email, but mm -hmm. there's this class. Here's the link. Jump on in and, and sign up. So we we find a lot of our Vendor 101 students coming from our markets application process and the application process at other markets around the country that have referred. Yeah, love that. So feel free to refer your prospective yeah. vendors to Vendor 101 and let us know if you start a program because we want to you know, check that out for sure. Vendor education absolutely boosts that vendor success and retention, and it heads off problems with folks who don't realize how much work and commitment is required to run a farmer's market business. Whether you create your own class or let someone like us customize an existing online resource, or if you partner with another organization, trained vendors are happy people, and happy people make happy markets. Thanks for listening today, and thank you to everyone who registers for classes like Vendor 101 or refers people to that course for supporting all the work we do at Farmers Market Pros to support farmers, vendors, and markets. Your conference registrations and online class and consulting purchases support production of the free content that we provide every week, year-round, on Tent Talk and in our private Facebook community. The 8th Annual Intense, the Multinational Farmers Market Conference, is coming up before we know it in San Diego and online March 4th, 5th, and 6th, 2024, just around the corner. Reserve your place now to take advantage of the last week of early pre-order pricing by clicking the register button on the homepage at FarmersMarketPros.com. Thanks for listening to Tent Talk today. Please leave us a review on your podcast app or wherever you listen to Tent Talk. Let us and others know how you're enjoying the podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of Tent Talk. Connect with fellow Farmers Market folks in our private Facebook group, the Farmers Market Pros community. Follow us on Instagram at Farmers Market Pros and find online education and other resources on our website at FarmersMarketPros.com. Tent Talk is brought to you by Farmers Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Tent Talk is produced by Leandra Hayes, with original music by David Mead. Tune in next week for another great episode.